Oh, good evening, everyone. It's my privilege to be here again tonight to address the message of the gospel, to read the word of God, which we believe to be very important, and to speak a little thereon. And just before we read the scriptures, as would be our normal practice, we'll pray and ask God for his blessing. Our God and our Father, we come once again to Thee, and we make our approach into Thy presence in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. We thank Thee for that name that avails before Thy throne. It is the only basis on which we are able to come to Thee, and we thank Thee for a way that's opened for us just to enter into the divine presence, that we might once again not only give thanks to Thee, and to offer praise to Thee, but to speak again to Thee with regard to the help that is needed and required as we again open Thy Word. We thank Thee for Thy Word. We thank Thee for its power. It has an inherent power. We thank Thee for this. It is sharp and it is powerful, sharper. It is declared in Thy Word than any two-edged sword. And so we pray as we read the Word of God tonight and as we meditate upon it and speak upon it and quote it, we pray that it will be to the blessing of many. We ask again that the power of Thy Spirit might be in Thy Word, that the ears which hear might uh, result in hearts being touched and So we pray that the power of thy word through thy spirit will be effective in the hearts and in the minds and in the lives of all who hear. And we pray for the going forth of the gospel wherever it is, not only here, but wherever there is a proclamation made of the gospel, we pray that it will be to thy glory and it will bring honor to the Lord Jesus, but As the gospel goes forth, we pray that it will also be to the blessing and salvation to precious souls. And so we're committed to thee, we're cast upon thee, we ask thee then just for thy help and for thy blessing now, and we do so in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I just want to read one or two verses in my reading tonight is in John's first epistle. And in chapter 3, and we'll just read a few verses from this chapter. We won't take time and we won't have time to deal with all that is in the chapter. We'll have a look at maybe the first couple of verses of the chapter. But we'll read uh, a few verses just at the beginning. And so, First John chapter 3, and it begins like this. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him, purifieth himself even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Now that's just the first five verses of this chapter. 1 John chapter 3, and uh, we do trust that God will bless, as he does, the public reading of his word. And we trust that it will be a blessing to you, as you have heard, and as we look at these things tonight. So I just want to take uh, one or two of the thoughts out of uh, these verses that we have read, particularly the first couple of verses, and just consider what John is actually saying in these verses. 
Those of you who know the scriptures will know that John, in his epistle, deals with three main subjects. He deals with life, he deals with light, and he deals with love. And we want to look at what we find uh, with regards to the third of these, that is, the love that John writes to us about. And so he says at the beginning of this chapter, Behold what manner of love. We're going to consider love. The love of God. A great thing. Something that has been demonstrated to the world. Because John in his gospel says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The love of God demonstrated. And it's the same John that is taking up uh, his pen, and he has written these uh, chapters for us here. And so we want to consider something of this love that John has written to us about. John says, behold. That's not just a glance. That's not just a glimpse. The idea on the word behold is, the idea is to look, of course, but it's to look with contemplation. It's to look with interest. It's to look upon it with great consideration. And you know, just uh, I've written over this word in my notes. Distinguish. It's to view this love in distinction to other loves. I suppose really that love and relationship has really come into focus in these last few weeks when people have been separated the one from the other and not able to come together. And love and relationships have been brought very much to mind and have been brought to the fore. That's human love. And what John wants us to do is to look at this love that he's speaking about and to see that it's a love that's distinguished from other loves. And so, John says, behold, I suppose I could put it like this, take a long, lingering look at this love and distinguish it from other loves, the soppy love of the world. And John goes on to explain something a little about this love. And John says, what manner of love? What manner of love. I, I put the word for that I put is different. This is a different kind of love from what is commonly known amongst people today. It's different because it is the love of God. You know, the actual meaning of the word manner. The, the, the meaning of the word that's used in the original text in the Greek. It means from what country? In other words, it's a love that has come from somewhere else. And it has come to us. I like one of the translations I have. And Kenneth Woost and his translation says, it's an exotic love. I suppose there are many people today and they've had to cancel exotic holidays. And if they've been considering and thinking of exotic holidays, well, that's on the back burner for sure. Because we can't travel. And if we do travel, there's restrictions. And so exotic holidays and You've seen the brochures, I'm sure, and you've seen the adverts for exotic holidays. Places that are, well, might be described as out of this world. 
because they're so different. And they're so good. They're so different because they're so good. And Kenneth Woos translates this word. He says, what exotic love the Father hath bestowed upon us. And you know, it's interesting. It's, it is a love that's out of this world. Because it's a divine love. This love that John's speaking about originated in heaven. It's the love of God. And as I said at the beginning, John in his gospel says it was demonstrated by God to the world. And that God sent his son, the Lord Jesus, into the world to be the savior of the world. So John says, what manner of love. Do you know, I was noticing today as I was looking at these things. This is the only time that John uses this word. John has written a gospel. And in that gospel, he doesn't use this word, manner. He only uses it in this epistle that he's written here, this first of three epistles at the end of, uh, near the end of our Bible. But I did notice this, that Matthew uses this word. And Matthew gives us a narrative in his gospel, about the disciples in a ship. And in that ship, they're caught in the midst of a storm. And they fear for their life. And they make their appeal to Jesus. And he arises, and he calms the storm. And these men are astounded. They've seen something different. And these men say, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? A different kind of man. This is the one that God sent into the world to be the savior of the world. A different kind of man. A perfect man. We read just where we finished reading tonight it says this about him. And in him is no sin. That in itself makes him so different from all other, all other men, from all other human beings, because there was no sin in him. In direct contrast to the fact, as Paul tells us in the Romans, all have sinned and come short of the glory of of God. And just the other morning there I was reading in First Kings. And as Solomon de dedicated that temple that he built, as he utters his prayer, he speaks about the sin of men. And he adds this, for there is no man that sinneth not. We are sinners by nature and we are sinners by practice. But this man was so different. The Son of God who came into the world and in him is no sin. And the disciples, when they see him calm the storm, they say, what manner of man is this? A different kind of man altogether. And we'll think just a little more about that as we come to it. Mark uses it in his gospel. Luke uses it in his gospel. And Peter uses it in his first epistle in various contexts. And you will find, if you read these, you would find that it's a different kind of thing altogether in each of these uh, sections of Scripture. And so John says, Behold what manner of love. A different kind of love. A love that's distinguished from every other kind of love. And that is because it's a divine love. It's divine it finds its source in God. And God has demonstrated that love, as we have mentioned already, as recorded in John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, John uses the expression in his epistle here uh, three times. 
He calls it the love of God. This divine love. In chapter 2 of his epistle, John says this, Whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. The love of God is perfected in a person who keeps the word of God. That is, obedient to the spoken word of God, obedient to the commandments of God. And the love of God is perfected in that person. But maybe more to what we're thinking of tonight. In chapter 3, just further down the chapter from where we read, we, we would read these words. Um, In verse 16, interestingly enough, isn't it? We have John's Gospel 3, verse 16. Here we have 1 John 3, verse 16. And it says this, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He, that is Christ, laid down His life for us. That's what love does. He laid down his life. How? Where? When did he do that? Ah, he did that at Calvary. He laid down his life. He gave himself as a sacrifice at the place called Calvary. And there, he took the punishment for sin. He bore the judgment of God. There he went into death. And John says, in these verses. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life. An amazing thing. The love of God demonstrated in the person of the Lord Jesus, not only in his coming into the world, but in the fact that he laid down his life. In chapter 4 of John's gospel, uh, in John's epistle, he uses uh, this expression again, and that's in verse 9. He says this, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. You see, Paul makes it very clear when we come to the book of the Romans that the wages of sin is death. But he adds this, the gift of God is eternal life. And so there's, there is life eternal, and we have that, we, we recorded that as we spoke of John chapter 3 and verse 16, the demonstration of God's love. And when we come to this verse, the love of God is manifest Because that he sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him, that we might have life. You know, the very words of the Lord Jesus himself as he spoke to the people of his day, he said this, I am come that you might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. More abundantly. Not the natural life that we normally have, but what he's speaking about is eternal life. And that was the demonstration of God's love And so we find the love of God. The love of God was manifested. So not only is it distinguished, not only is it different, not only is it divine, but it was displayed. It was displayed. God displayed his love. And we have this word here that John uses. The love of God was manifested in that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we may live by him. So it was manifested. It was displayed. That's a word that John uses in his epistle here. And I've been quite impressed by this. The word manifested. John speaks about the fact in in chapter 1. In verse 2 he says, For the life was manifested and we have seen it. What is John speaking about? Well, if we go back to verse 1, just the verse preceding that, John says this, That which we have That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which we have handled, our hands have handled, of the word of life. What is the word of life? 
Well, again, we refer back to John's gospel. And John tells us this at the beginning of his gospel. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. What is he speaking about? He's speaking about the Son of God. He's speaking about Jesus Christ. He's speaking about the one who came into the world. That by him the world might be saved. And so he was manifested. Christ was manifested. Christ was, as it were, put on display. And he moved amongst men and he walked the sands of time. To use some of the cliches that we normally use. But he moved amongst men and he demonstrated the love of God as well as the power of God as he moved before men and preached to them the gospel. And so he was manifested. But in chapter 3 of this, and we read it in verse 5, he was manifested, that is the Lord Jesus. Ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And then that's where we finished. And in him is no sin. It took one without sin to take away our sin. And he was manifested. He was displayed for that purpose. That he might take away sin. And where more was he manifested than when he was lifted up upon a cross on the hill of Calvary. You know he said to Nicodemus. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and again, this is John recording this for us. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so he was lifted up, he was put on display. You know, the Bible says this about the people of that day. When they came to Calvary, it says, sitting down, they watched him there. They looked upon that cross. They looked upon the one who was upon that cross. Or they looked with mocking eyes. They looked with disdain. There were those who passed by and it meant nothing to them. One in the scriptures of old one wrote, Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow wherewith the sorrow wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me. There were those who passed by and they wagged their heads. It meant nothing to them. But there he was manifested. He was lifted up. And he was manifested to take away our sins. Verse 8 of the same chapter. And we didn't read down as far as that. But it says this. That he was manifested. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. That he might destroy the works of the devil. What is the works of the devil? The works of the devil is to ensnare men, to ensnare people, to cause them to do evil. The work of Satan. We don't have time, but we can reflect on the serpent in the garden, beguiling Eve and causing Adam to sin. And because of that, because of that man's disobedience, sin entered into the world and death by sin. The works of the devil. He's constantly trying to bring men down. To destroy people. But here is one. The Lord Jesus, the Son of God, was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And so... We, might, we could maybe look at others. We, we have maybe referred to, he was manifested. God sent his, the love of God was manifested in this, that he sent his son that we may live through him. We don't want to get into any more detail for that. But you know, the interesting thing about this chapter is here, he doesn't speak about it as the love of God. He says, behold what manner of love the Father, the Father hath bestowed upon us. As I said at the beginning, love and relationships have been brought into question and have been brought to the fore of people's minds in these last few days. Here is love and a relationship. It's the love of a father. You see, God so loved the world 
But many of, many of the world today and in past days have rejected the love of God. Why? Because they have rejected the Christ of God. They have rejected the Son of God. So they have rejected the love of God. They've turned their back upon God. But what John's speaking here is the love of the Father, which he hath bestowed upon us. You see, there's a relationship there. Can I ask you the question, what is your relationship with God? Do you know him as your father? Or is he still just the eternal God with whom you have no dealings? You may not want to have dealings. I trust you do. But better still, to know him as your father, to have a relationship with him. You know, the Lord Jesus said this, I am the way. It's one of the I am's of John's gospel. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The only way you can come into a relationship with God and know him as your Father is through the person of the Lord Jesus, the one whom the Father sent into the world to be the Savior of the world, the one who was manifested to put away sin, the one who was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Only through him you can come to God and know him as your Father. A relationship with God. And you know, as John speaks about this, he says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. He hath bestowed upon us. Are you in the good of the love of God? Or oh, the love of God has been demonstrated, as we've seen in John chapter 3, verse 16. The love of God has been demonstrated. Been demonstrated in God sending His Son into the world. Been demonstrated in the fact that He has been lifted up upon a cross. He has borne the judgment for sin. He has taken the punishment for sin. He has provided eternal life, everlasting life, which can be yours just through simple faith and trust in Him. Do you know that? Have you come into that relationship? Do you know him as your father? But God has bestowed this upon us. You know, the idea is to uh, somebody who is superior and is able to give a gift or is able to express his goodness. It's the idea of granting and you know it's given generously and not grudgingly. You know, we don't deserve the love of God. None of us do. And yet God in His grace, and I suppose grace would sum that up, a gift, the goodness of God, the granting of this love. Generously. Not withholding, giving liberally. And God will do that with His love if you will come to trust him through faith in the Lord Jesus. Something that's delivered by God to you, because I understand that could be part of the meaning of bestowed. Something that is delivered, that's brought right to you. Are you in the good of it? Have you received it? Are you still rejecting it? I trust not. And so John says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called sons of God. Called. Described. We've been thinking about a love that's distinguished, a love that's different, a love that's divine, a love that's been displayed, a love that's been bestowed, it's been delivered to us. And he says that we should be called the sons of God. Described as the sons, the children of God. But you know, as we consider this, I was thinking it's not just a name. It's not just a title. It's not just a name that's given to us. But John goes on to show as we come into the next verse, and I think it's important that we come into this next verse. He says this, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. I was thinking of that word, now. Some people have the impression, you know, that it's been said, and perhaps you've heard it been said, we're all God's children. 
We're all one. We're all God's children. Now, John would tell us here that we're not all God's children. Because John says here, now are we the sons of God. You know, as I look at this verse, I can see that there's a past that's referred to. And there's a present that's referred to. And there's a future that's referred to in this verse. A past. We weren't always the children of God. And if you want to come to some kind of conclusion about that, you just read uh, the book of Ephesians. And particularly in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul, as he writes to the Ephesians, he spoke to them about the fact that there was a time in their life when they were the sons or the children of disobedience. And again, just a few verses down that chapter, he speaks about them being the sons, the children of wrath. What's he actually saying? Now you know as well as I do, as soon as a baby's born, one of the big things that people want to look at the baby for is to see what traits in the baby are in the parents. Because there are traits from the parents into the baby. Does it look like the father? Does it look like the mother? Is there family traits in that baby? That's what Paul means when he writes to the Ephesians and he said, the children of disobedience. What characterized them? Disobedience, rebellion, hatred to God, and wrath. Well, we live in an angry society, don't we? Wrath. Children of wrath. And you know, when Paul was writing to the Ephesians, he was actually telling them that that's what they once were. They once were that. But you know, at the beginning of Ephesians in chapter 1, Paul tells them this, that they have been adopted as sons. They've been brought into the family of God. Now, are you in the family of God? Have you been brought into the family of God? Or are you still the children of? A child of? Scripture speaks of a child of the devil. Are you still a child of Satan? Or are you a child of? of God. What is the past of your life? Oh, I wouldn't want to bring it up. Oh, perhaps you wouldn't want to bring it up either. But what about the past of your life? But what about the present? John, as he writes to these people, he says, now are we the children or the sons of God. What a relationship. Is that your relationship with God? Have you come to know Christ as Saviour? Have you come to know God as your Father? Have you left that past behind you? Do you now know that divine love engulfing you? Are you in the sphere of that love? You know, Scripture speaks about the love of God which is shed abroad in our hearts. A love that fills our hearts. That divine love, do you know it? Do you have it? Just through repentance and simple faith, you can have it and know a relationship. What manner of love. But you know, John thinks in this verse about the past. And he thinks about the present. He says to these people, now are we the sons of God. We weren't always that. But he says, now we are. And then he adds this about the future. He says, and, what shall, uh, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When he shall appear. I spoke just a minute or two ago there about that word manifested. Well, this is the very same word here in the original. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, when he shall appear, when he shall be manifested. You see, he is going to be manifested again. He was manifested once before when he came into the world. He born a babe in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, moved out into public ministry and moved amongst men. He was manifested before. But of course, he died upon the cross. He was buried. He was raised again the third day. He ascended to heaven. He will appear again. He will be manifested again. And John says, this is the value of being a child, a son of God. 
the value of it is this. We don't know what we shall be. We cannot be certain about what we shall be, but we can be certain about this, that when He is manifested again, when He comes again, John says we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Isn't that a wonderful thing? You know, Christ is coming again. He will return. He's coming to call His own away. Will you be one of the called? Will you be called away or will you be left for judgment? That's the simple question. In other words, are you a child of God? Have you come into the good of His first manifestation? His putting away of sin? His destroying the works of the devil? His perfecting the person who is obedient? Will you be called away at his second manifestation? What a bright future. It's a hope. We, fit, we read further down, whoever has this hope within them purifieth himself. Do you have that hope? Or are you still languishing in despair of sin? Why not come to Christ tonight? Why not absorb, as it were, this love, this exotic love, this love that originated in heaven, a love that can touch your soul, that can affect your heart, that will set your feet on a course for heaven and for bliss. Turn away from your past. Turn to Christ tonight. And you will be able to say, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon me. Trust Christ. Know God as your Father. And have this hope of eternal bliss. Now we'll just ask God to bless His Word. Our God and our Father, we come again to Thee in the name of the Lord Jesus, and we thank Thee again for a consideration of Thy great love. What a love it is. And we thank Thee too for its manifestation, as seen in the person of the Lord Jesus, His coming into the world, His moving amongst men, His going to the cross at Calvary, we thank Thee again for the one who was crucified for our sins, who was laid in the tomb but emerged therefrom, and the one who ascended again into heaven, and we're thankful for the fact that He is coming again. We pray that the very thought of these things might impress many a heart, that those who know Him as Saviour and Know thee as Father, will rejoice in these things. But any that have not yet come to this in their life, that they might, through thy word and the power of the Spirit, turn tonight and come to Christ. So we commit it all to thee. Every light gathering to this, everywhere the word has gone forth, every heart that has heard, every ear that's been opened, we pray a blessing upon it. So we ask these things now, as once again we commit all to thee in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ.